What is up? Welcome to this week's episode of the Van Flip Podcast. I am your host, Lurk, and today I am joined by, uh, or joined with Jeff Irwin of the long-running band Willhaven. Welcome to the show, Jeff. How are you doing, man? Good, thanks. How are you? I'm doing great. It is, uh, awesome. it's, a, it's a nice Monday evening here. Yeah, it's actually still Monday afternoon here, so. Yeah, I was going to ask, are you guys still <laughs> out? Uh, are you guys still out there in California? Yeah. Are you guys out there still? Yep, all still in Sacramento. Nice. Born and nice. raised. Yeah. Nice. My first, my first thing that I wanted to kind of start off with is uh, like, how sick are you guys of like the Deftones comparison? <laughs> uh, yeah, it's. I mean, it, it's it, yeah, it's funny. I, I saw a couple magazines like say some like you know, uh, just recently kind of saying if you you know like Deftones or whatever. I mean, it's cool. I mean, it's there's worse bands to be you know lumped in with for sure. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. But uh, yeah, it's it's. I don't hate it. I don't hate it on our side. I feel bad for those guys more so because they're probably sick of hearing their name. Will haven't always been brought up with their name. <laughs> it's like, yeah. I mean, how how long can we ride those guys' coattails? I hate when you know, but I don't think they think that. But sometimes I think that. But um, but I don't I don't mind it in the sense that they are our buddies and we are still close and you know they are an inspiration for us and. You know, we grew up with those guys, and we, yeah. we, there wouldn't be a Willie will without Deftones. So I, we owe a lot to them. And um, you know, that if that name comes up, I don't go, "Oh, that sucks." You know, I, 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 I totally embrace it. You know. Yeah, no, I get it. But I mean, I, I, I had to ask because every time you know you hear Will Haven, it's followed shortly or within the same couple paragraphs or sentences of the word Deftones. It's kind of all, yeah, somewhat married uh, to each other. So you know, I would assume like as a band you want to kind of stand on your own two feet as well so constantly hearing yeah. that comparison but again like that they've changed their sound so often that it doesn't even really stick anymore you know i mean maybe in those early adrenaline around the fur days when you know aggressive ag aggressive music was all just kind of you know forming new uh sub -genres and stuff like that you guys are in the same area so of course it's going to kind of sound similar but you know you guys straight off shortly after that yeah, I think we, uh, like, it. you know, I, I, I was already good friends with Deftones way before I started Willhaven. So there's, there was definitely an influence there when I started Willhaven. I didn't necessarily set out to be Deftones, but, you know, being my best friends and hanging out with them all the time, of course, is going to seep into your music. But, you know, as the time went on, we, yeah, we both kind of just kind of done our own thing, you know. But I think it all started because the Deftones took us out on our first record on mm. tour. You know, we, we barely even, we played out of Sacramento a few times. We actually did a West uh, East Coast tour before we went out with them. But our first major step into the real music world was with Deftones. They kind of took us under their wing. So I get it where people just assume that we're in that camp because, you know, they, they were kind of the ones that championed us first out of anybody. So, mm. um, like I said, we wouldn't be here without them. So well, uh, what else was going on in that time frame locally to you guys that was also kind of like just bubbling up um, because obviously like when one thing mm -hmm. happens an area you know the record labels kind of focus their laser beams in an area and they kind of shoot around and get a couple different bands from that uh, you know area to kind of like see what works but out outside of the Deftones and Willhaven what else did they kind of like you know snag up uh, Far got signed oh, yeah, to true. Uh, Immortal uh, Sony, um, right around a little after Deftones did. Uh, I mean, Papa Roach came in a little bit after we had already kind of done our own stuff. Um, Hake got signed, but you know they kind of blew up a little later too right. with their singles and stuff. Um, I mean, Tesla's always been here. Uh, what other bands came? I mean, I mean we had a lot of like up and coming bands that yeah, never really. What... Which ones Broke didn't? Through, yeah, you know? Which ones were those that didn't really make the uh, make the cut, but would have you know, but are, were still like big local draws that you know did some regional stuff or whatnot. Uh, you know, I guess there was a band there was a band called Simon Says that I guess oh, Simon yeah. Hollywood. I, I remember that. I remember that. Yeah. Yeah, uh, and then you know they were kind of in that where bands in Sacramento were starting to get looked at more seriously, and I think the Papa Roach thing really like sparked it because Deftones were like the first band to kind of get that major label sign out of that new era. And then far, and then when Pop Roach got signed, they sold what seven million off their first record. That's when everybody's like, "Oh, let's look at bands at Sack." You know, let's. Yeah. What are these other bands that they're managed by? Because their Pop Roach first manager, Brett, is from Sacramento, so and he was doing like Alien Ant Farm and a lot of other bands. So they were like just honing on Brett, like, "All right, your band just sold seven million. Like, whatever the band you got for us, yeah. you know." So he was kind of 
he was kind of feeding bands to the major label uh, industry too. So, um, yeah, I mean, there was a lot of bands that, that did get signed and never put out a record, which was crazy. Like we had one of my best friends' bands got signed to, I think, DreamWorks, I think, and they DreamWorks took care of them for like a year, but they never even put out a record. <laughs> it was just, it was crazy for a while, you know. But that's when money was flowing. I mean, that was yeah. like late <laughs> late nineties, like everybody. I mean, the labels are just throwing money at everybody, yeah. you know. So it's one of those things. But you know, we never became the Seattle scene, but. I mean, there were some pretty iconic bands that came out of Sacramento. You know, they did some damage. Yeah, for sure. Uh, 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 that's why I asked. I had to ask because, like, you know, so many bands from that time frame did come from that area uh, of California. So, you know, I had to ask. Simon, oh, says, yeah, yeah. No. definitely remember that little yeah. email band. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was, a, it was a cool scene, you know. I, I think a lot of the earlier bands were better than the ones that got the deals, you know. Yeah. but. That's just how it goes, you know. I mean, yeah, that's how the locals are supposed to kind of react to that. Yeah, um, totally. So how does how does Will Haven come about? You know, like obviously you said you're friends with the Deftones before they were the Deftones. So are you guys like all jamming around, you know, with each other, and then all of a sudden they kind of form up, and then at some point Jeff and the boys form up? Yeah. So I mean, Deftones were around when I became friends with Chino and and Steph and those guys. I mean, they had just started, you know, playing around Sacramento, but. They had a little bit of a draw, but they weren't drawn huge yet. And then I became really close with the Far guys. Um, I met actually Far was around as well, but they were just they had put out their first demo. So it was after college. I started hanging out with those guys. I mean, me and Sean Lopez from Far became roommates, and I lived with him for like ten years. And so I was I was there from the beginning from like Far and Deftones, seeing them become a local band to a headliner to all of a sudden getting signed. So. <laughs> You know, I was there. I, I was just kind of roadie. I mean, I roadie for far for a little bit. I roadie for Deftones for a little bit back in the way back in the day. And I thought, figure out, hey, maybe I'll just be involved somehow with roadie or whatever. And and then uh, I played drums in a band. Me and Sean had started a side band together called Sock, and because we were roommates, so we just started uh, jamming together. And and Sock put out a demo tape, and we were looking to get a, like a, we were looking to get maybe signed by Victory or something like that. We were talking to Victory, but. That didn't pan out, and then Far got signed uh, to Sony, and then when Far got signed, that's when Sock kind of broken up because Sean was busy with Far. So I was like, you know, I, I still want to play music. Um, so I started a band with Grady and Mike and and Wayne, who were, were my best friends at the time, outside of you know the, the Far Deftones guys, and we just started playing, we started jamming, and we didn't really think much of it, you know, like we started writing songs, and then all of a sudden the songs kind of turned into a demo, and then. The demo got assigned to Revelation, and then all of a sudden we're putting out El Diablo. So it was like, it was like really organic bands that we weren't put together as like anything but just friends playing music, you know. And it still yeah. is that that way today, but it was just very organically done. Like we didn't think anything would happen with it. We were just hanging out, you know. <laughs> when did you? But luckily, on. luckily we knew the right. Luckily we knew the right people at the right time, you know. Like right when Depth, right when Far, or sorry, right when Blavin started kind of getting a little bit of momentum that's when deftones got signed far got signed so you know they were those two bands were looking out for us putting us on shows up in good company, form, yeah, uh, in good company yeah man. so we got lucky dude like it's like i say <laughs> you know seriously like yeah. i mean one in a million bands get the opportunity to have like two of your best friends like get signed to like major labels and go on and do some pretty cool stuff you know true yeah um when did you start playing? Because uh, you're, you're, you know, you play guitar in Wilhaven. So were you playing guitar before you were playing drums, or were you just messing around on the drums with your buddy, in sock? <laughs> yeah, uh, well, it's funny. I, I, my dad played guitar when I was a kid, and uh, and I always I had this. I always wanted to start a band with my dad, you know. And I was yeah. like, Dad, buy me, buy, buy me some drum sets, and I'll, we'll start a band together. So. Uh, by the time I was 12, he finally, like, for Christmas, bought me a drum set. And so me and him would just kind of just screw around at the, his house. And then I took drums home and because I was at his house. I took it to my mom's house where I ended up living full time. And I just played drums every single day after school on the weekends. Anytime I could play my drums, I did. As a kid, and that would, was from as a kid normally would. You know? Yeah, totally. Yeah, <laughs> just like annoying the fucking neighbors, like playing in the middle of the night and getting trouble by mom. Like it was it was chaos. But I love my drum set and I just, that's all I live for, you know? So when I moved in with Sean from far, like I still played drums. I actually played in another little fun band with some guys I didn't really know. I was just playing drums with them and stuff. So drums were there and then we started sock and I played drums in sock and I totally fell in love with playing with other musicians, like my friends too. And so when sock broke up, you know, if we try to replace Sean, um, 
we tried we tried to start something else with somebody another guitar player and we tried a bunch of guitar players and they were horrible you know mm -hmm. they didn't i mean sean sean's kind of a unique individual when it comes to like writing that kind of stuff so it was hard to replace them and i was like screw it i always had a i always wanted to play guitar in a way and this was my chance to like put the drums aside and just pick up guitar and start playing guitar um because i've learned a lot from my dad and i'd been around sean for and stefan for so long i was like hey i could figure this out you know it's not yeah. that hard you know okay so that's how that's how guitar came into my life is when I started Willhaven. It just it was a new challenge and wanted to try something different. And I always thought guitar was kind of a fun instrument to play. So, so how proficient were you really at it when when you started Willhaven or when you started writing with Willhaven? I should say. No, I was I was terrible. I mean, I'm still terrible. Like I don't I don't know notes. I don't know I know chords. I know a few notes here and there. That's a running but... thing. That's a running thing with most of you most of the musicians that I've talked to for the most part. It's a it's a roll of the dice. And I would say most of them aren't, uh, I don't want to say like classically trained, but like most of them don't necessarily know like notes or what the chords call. They just know the hand placement and what it sounds like or what sounds are made on the fretboard and when, you know, what you have to do with your hands and stuff like that. So you're not, you're, you're not like alone in that aspect where, you know, you're not like as good as you think you are. You're probably better than a lot of people out there, but you know. Well, it's funny because like I don't think Sean didn't take lessons, neither did Stefan, you know. And look what they became, you know. So <laughs> it's it's all about it's like I did take low end lesson, and when I started playing, I was like, well, I'll take a lesson. And he tried to teach me like some Led Zeppelin song, and I'm like, I'm not here to learn Led Zeppelin. Like I want to I want to like learn how to play the guitar, you know. Mm -hmm. And so every lesson I learned after that or heard about it was like they were just trying to teach you like songs. I'm like, that's not what I want to. I want to play my own songs, you know. So. Yeah. That's how I was like, screw it. I'm gonna just learn on my own. And basically, guitar for me isn't isn't an, an instrument to me. It's more an expression of who I am. So it's how the cheesy to say, but it is it is in a way because yeah. like how I play my guitar is what I'm feeling. You know, like when I pick up the guitar and I strum whatever I strum because I don't really know a lot of chords, but whatever I put my finger somewhere and it sounds like it moves me, then I'm like, all right, I'm keeping that. You know, or I'm gonna work with that or whatever. So. Yeah, it's as cheesy as it sounds. It's true. Like it is just an extension of like me. Of my like I, I'm a very like mellow dude. But when I pick up a guitar, I want to just I want to kill shit. I want to break shit. You know, like I I have this rage inside me when I play the guitar. It's like I just want to like play that gnarly stuff I can. You know, mm. um, but without even knowing how to play it. <laughs> Are you? Um, who's the biggest um, songwriter in the group then and now? Uh, me. You? Know? All right. Yeah. That's, that's kind of what yeah, I was yeah. wondering. Um, yeah. Because again, it's like. I'm trying to like think of how good you were. I mean, you were good enough to at least toss together a couple songs for a for a, a demo. You know what I mean? So you're you're proficient enough at playing guitar for that, which you know that that would take normal people years to get to that level. Well, I I've actually told people this too. Like, if you want to learn how to play pretty much bass or even guitar, if you can learn how to play drums first, like that is a huge stepping stone of becoming a good guitar player because your rhythmic skills like you play like I play as a drummer mm -hmm. like my timing like 6-8 timing or whatever I play as I'm hearing drums in my head a lot of guitar players don't know how to play drums so they're just playing something they don't they don't hear the drums in their head they just take it to the drummer mm -hmm. and you do what you're going to do over it but for me I'm very rhythmic and that's why like El Diablo and all these early records are so rhythmic is because that's how I'm hearing it in my head like how I'm still playing the drums as long as I'm playing these riffs. So, so for me, it's like learning how to play drums and playing drums forever. Like I have that rhythmic timing in my head. So when I play guitar, I'm not thinking of the notes or like song structures. I'm just playing how I play drums on guitar, basically, yeah. which is making the most evilest notes I can play. So that's how I became proficient at like trying to figure out how to write songs. I, I have a band in my head already. You know, instead yeah. of just picking up guitar and playing, I could have a band playing in my head as I'm playing my guitar. And but you can see it, like even with I, with Dave Grohl, it's like one of the baddest drummers ever. But dude, he's one of the he's an awesome guitar player too and singer. So it's but I think he has that same thing that I have, like right. that rhythmic thing in his head where he just can pick up guitar and like percussively play it, you know, and get a timing in his head and get a rhythm in his head and like okay, I can write a song. It's not that hard, you know. Yeah, that's interesting. That's an interesting way to see it. Um, I, mean, cause yeah. I, I mean, I don't see it like that, even though I don't play drums, but I also don't really want to claim to know how to play guitar either. I'm in the process of learning, you know, I have a couple of years under my belt, but I, uh, 
trying the old YouTube university route, you know, and so yeah. I'm learning it that way. <laughs> I do that too. Like I, there's a lot of songs that I would love to like play, like Pink Floyd songs mm. or like songs that I've heard on the radio. I'm like, I want to play that. So I'll go on YouTube and I'll learn like the chords, or whatever. So I, I mean, I've, I've the, over the years I've learned how to play certain notes and chords and stuff and, and cover songs. But like for me, like Will Haven, I don't want to know anything. I just want to like pick it up and play whatever comes out, you know, like yeah. I'm, I'm no songs, no chord structure and nothing like that. I just wanted to be the most weirdest shit I could play out of that thing. That brings me to the next like kind of bit of questions here. You know, the earlier stuff from you guys, because I know we started out with the Deftones reference and obviously like, like whenever I was thinking about this interview or podcast, I was thinking about <clears throat> how it doesn't really... I mean, yeah, the Deftones reference maybe works because you guys both are from Sacramento and both aggressive. But if you really take a second and listen to like both of your earlier records, like you guys have so much more of a metalcore scene, like hardcore influence than like they do or they did, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And that was the most surprising thing because you guys, and again, I I grew up listening to new metal and I love new metal, but you also did get lumped into a lot of new metal chatter earlier in the day, mm -hmm. uh, earlier back in the day. And I remember that because I was, you know, cognizant of you guys back then too. So uh, do you think like, like where, what were your influences in those early days? Cause you also mentioned getting signed to victory and being, you know, will having being on revelation. So you guys, you know, had, had some feet or, you know, some part of the, body in the scene you know in the hardcore metal scene so i just wanted to kind of expand on that yeah so uh when i moved into with sean um from far um his first band that he was ever in was called inner strength mm -hmm. and they were straight edge like straight edge band mm -hmm. and they were the first band on in on victory yeah so sean has always been in that scene like he's always been involved like known to that scene mostly because our friend jeff jaworski who we wrote a song about um was always into that scene so when i moved in with sean like i started getting into like youth of today and gorilla biscuits and that whole revelation catalog and then all of a sudden you see like you know the victory catalog coming out with earth prices and snapcase and dead guy and bloodlet and i was like okay that's that's where my like yeah inspiration really came from and so you know i but i was in faith no more and stuff like it. a lot of the bands that death tones were inspired by like bad brains faith no more stuff like that i was into as well but when i started willhaven it was more like I didn't really want to do what my friends were doing because I don't th I, for me like I didn't think I was that good yeah. <laughs> to begin with you know well, they're, they're, also, already they're, somewhat... they're getting like and no offense to anybody or anything but like they're they're going like a totally different trajectory they're, they're like shooting for the stars so to speak like because yeah. around that same time like MTV's huge and like clearly those bands uh, were shooting for like the quote unquote rock star lifestyle whereas like maybe the bands you're listening to are like totally not going that route. They're in the totally under, yeah. underground. underground. Yeah. 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 And, and, but yeah. It's, and, but also like when I was starting Will Haven, Deftones already been around for God for a while. And to me, like they were some of the best musicians in Sacramento by then, you know, Abe had joined yeah. Deftones during that around 95 or whatever. And when he joined the band, I was like, okay, that's the most, most all-star Sacramento you can have. Like Chino's the best singer, Steph's the best guitar in the So I was like, I started Will Haven. I was like, okay, I'm not that good. So I, I don't think I could write that kind of stuff. But so I didn't want to be what my friends were doing. And then also I had other influences that were like neuro neurosis mm. and like bloodlet. Um, neurosis was a huge influence on me at the beginning. Um, so I was more into that kind of stuff, you know? And then that's when I had the base of Will Haven was kind of neurosis, bad brains kind of stuff. And then, and then, uh, we actually started, we had a manager um, who ended up managing like uh, Snapcase and Earth Crisis really early on. He actually managed FAR for a little bit too. And he got into the LA hardcore scene, you know, and he piped us into that. Um, and we were opening up for like Strife mm. and whenever Snapcase would come into town and whenever Earth Crisis would, would come into town, we'd open up for them. We became really good friends with those guys. So like, before the whole Deftones thing that we got thrown into, like we were really into like that Victory of Revelation scene. Like right. we were playing Showcase Showcase Theater in LA all the time, which was like the big hardcore staple. And so, but the funny thing is that we were playing these shows, but we felt like we didn't fit in at all. Mm. You know, like 
it, that's that was a funny thing. It's like we were playing like Stripe and Earth Crisis, and like yeah, but listening but, back I mean, the, now, the, it's like it fits so it fits so well for that time. You know what it, I mean? Yeah, but back then they didn't get it because like we were <laughs> playing like more neurosis kind of stuff, and like then you had like them coming out playing Firestorm, which was like completely different. You yeah, know, for sure. For so. Sure. And the crowd was going nuts for it. So, but we didn't have like those anthems, those straight edge anthems. We weren't, we didn't claim straight edge. But I mean, we were in the scene, but we didn't claim it. We weren't, you know, as militant as some of those other bands were. So we weren't, we weren't, we were in that scene, but we didn't fit. I don't think we fit in. Um, and what's funny is when the Deftones took us out, we were still in that El Diablo kick, more neurosis C kind of, you know, stuff. Um, but that that fan base totally picked it up and loved it. So it was like weird. I you know us being from the hardcore scene, I thought they would love it. But actually, the, the newer metal fans, kids liked it. You know, and yeah, and then we went out with Slipknot, and the Slipknot fans loved us. And yeah, so it was like kind of a head fuck to me. I'm like, all right, I thought the hardcore kids liked this stuff, but actually, the newer metal kids like this stuff way yeah. more. It's like it was weird. Yeah, but uh, yeah, I don't. For me, it's like I don't think we ever really fit in wherever we opened up for. I just. Thought we were kind of like the a lot of bands the, said that too. Like Dead Guys said that in their documentaries and like other you know Drowning yeah, and all yeah. those things. All those bands, well, especially them. Yeah, yeah, all those bands that are kind of in the same vein. You know what I mean? Uh, early metalcore bands are, didn't fit in either because you're you're mixing a lot of you know you're mixing hardcore and metal and you're kind of yeah. forcing two together and some of the you know OGs don't really like that or take to that really well. But looking yeah, back it's funny, now. You know, I just watched that dead guy documentary and I, I felt like I had so much kinship with those guys in that, that documentary. <laughs> like I get it. I know exactly what you guys are talking about. And, yeah. uh, but I, I love every one of my favorite bands ever, you know? So I, i totally get it. And I felt, I felt, I, I felt connection to those guys. Yeah. I, I, we kind of played those scenes and we didn't feel like we fit in either. Yeah. Totally, it was like, we were kind of on our own, on our own little world, you know? So this, uh, you know, piggybacking off of that, like you guys, release will haven and and you guys are you know the 2000 what one carpe diem 2001 mm-hmm. right so yeah. you're releasing those those albums and then like all of a sudden you get lumped into this whole like new metal vibe uh you, you know you start i don't know if you start changing the sound that drastically or whatnot because again some of the newer stuff sounds similar to your earlier stuff so it's all relative but do you think like the new metal pairing like hurt will haven in the in the early days no because i i mean i think the new metal thing like i don't think our really our career really jumped until we did that deftones tour you know Mm -hmm. before the deftones tour we did we did a couple shows with bloodlet on the east coast we did uh cmj festival in new york and stuff and they were okay you know but we didn't feel like we ever popped at all like we never really headlined la or anything like that we always opened up for somebody and then when deftones took us out and we did the whole u.s and european stuff with them like that's when i felt like okay now we're a real band you know now where people are taking us more seriously and then that just snowballed into like we after that we toured with soulfly like a lot and we toured (laughs) with uh we tour with Fear Factory. We tour with Slipknot. Like, so we, like all these, and we we do that occasionally. We did you know, tape breeze and stuff like that. We, so we do, still dabble our toes in the hardcore scene, but yeah. and we, you know, we just have to converge and coalesce. But you know, the, it was like I felt like maybe it was a bigger audience that we were reaching with Deftones. Oh, for but sure. I yeah. felt like I felt that the Deftones crowd still to this day is more. I would say more of our made up fan base than it is the old hardcore crowd that we were playing for back in the day. Because everybody I talked to is like, oh, I saw you guys with Deftones in Florida or in London or whatever. Like, I don't hear anybody say, oh, I should I get the showcase up and up for, you know, Earth Crisis. I never hear that. I always yeah, hear, like, yeah. the Deftones story. So, obviously, well, I think all of our fan base is from that new metal world. So, it, I, I think, think it, it helped us. The reason I ask is because, like, a lot of that is lost on, like, you know, I, I, I forgot or just sometimes didn't even know that you guys moonlighted, like, so frequently like that early early on. You know, like I forget because like when I when I heard about you or when I when you would always be in the chatter of like online early blogs and early websites and stuff. Because I ran when I was like a young teenager, I also had a website similar to this one, like Lamb Goat, but more like new metal based. But, you know, when I kind of always lumped you guys into that window. So I, I it's, it was wild to when I was researching some stuff going like, oh, yeah, they were on Revelation. Oh, they, they're connected with this out of the other stuff. So it's weird, but, you know, part of me always also wonders, like, what happens if you would have gone more like that route uh, with touring with those bands? But again, 
you know, the crowds are much smaller. It would have been a lot harder to draw, uh, you know, at a quicker pace and stuff like that. And so obviously the opportunities presented with like bands like Soulfly and Slipknot and Deftones to a younger band are like, oh yeah, we'll just do that, obviously. But it was it was a weird time because like right when, right before we put out El Diablo or maybe right afterwards, that's when like the the major label world got involved with the hardcore scene. Like you saw Earth Crisis get signed to what uh, Roadrunner, mm-hmm. um, Strife was getting like looked at by like Jay Z's label at at or, or Stamp Case was at one point. Um, like Vision of Sorter got a record deal through. So like these hardcore bands were actually getting major label like recognition and like getting attention and then uh and then we went out with deftones but then earth prices was on Ozfest, and like uh, and they were opening up for like big bands and then so it's it was a weird time where the industry kind of like saw the hardcore scene kind of blowing up a little bit like yeah let's get our hands in this you know and a lot of those bands didn't pan out um but you look at bands like converge like they're huge yeah. you know yeah. and and they're probably there's other i mean they haven't toured with deftones so they're <laughs> way bigger than we are you know so i mean if we would have went that route i mean if we could have tagged along with like maybe a converge or uh you know any of those bands that still come around i mean we probably would have been okay you know i think we probably would have been where we're at you know in Mm -hmm. some regards but um yeah i mean it wasn't it was underground for when we initially got into that hardcore scene but then it started blowing up yeah and you know then the money came in and um then things got crazy but um but yeah, I think we got we got what was cool is we got to be in both worlds. You know, I feel like we're yeah. two different bands. Like we got signed Revelation, we were in this hardcore scene, and then all of a sudden we kind of only by the grace of God because we had best friends. The, the Deftones is the reason we moved we went out the other direction. You know, if we didn't know the Deftones guys, we'd probably still be in that converged like world of like doing the more underground kind of like metal shows, whatever. Yeah. Um, so you guys uh, last year. I want to kind of move into the current day because we keep like you know lamenting or not lamenting but we keep going back to the old days uh but last year you kind of um or maybe yeah 2022 last year you uh released like a sequel to uh um a documentary you did like early 2003 uh foreign foreign films Four. 2 was last year's um, yeah so how did that come about uh that was very organic really it's uh we were going on tour it was a 2019 and uh we were just doing like a short little european run Mm -hmm. and uh this guy had emailed me um and he's like hey i want to come on tour with you guys i just want to film a little thing on the road and i was like yeah man Uh, initially i I don't like people going on tour with us it's like you know we have a very small group of people and like when you bring somebody in new you're like okay i don't know who these people are but he i let him come out and we met him at the first show and he just turned out to be this really awesome person super cool mellow knew the band's history has been a fan of the band's carpe diem uh just very like didn't want to be in the way just kind of held out in the corner just popped in when he needed to be just we didn't even know he was there half the time like just a super rad guy we came really good friends with him he got so much good footage and then he ended up doing like a little interview in our london show each one of us and uh I think he was going to kind of do just like a fun little tour documentary. And then he sat down and was like, Hey, I got a bunch of footage here. Would you mind like doing like another kind of documentary based on the first one? I'm like, yeah, it sounds cool. And then he sent me like some uh, initial stuff for it. And I was like, this is awesome. Like, this is really cool. And so then he ended up putting it all together and we ended up putting it out as like a kind of a, yeah, foreign films too. So it was really organic. We didn't plan on doing that at all. Yeah, it just, okay. Dave just Dave just did an awesome job and like kind of turned it into something that would, turned out to be really cool. And like I, I totally love that that little documentary. That's awesome. Yeah, I, I didn't know if you like purposely waited, you know, almost two decades to release some kind of other, you know, behind the scenes kind of styled footage, or if it was just something that you, you know, like you said, organically happened. So it's always good yeah, when it right just about, kind of falls in your lap, you know. <laughs> yeah, what's right about this band is we don't plan shit. Like it just whatever happens, it just happens just to come out of thin air. Like I don't think we've ever planned anything. <laughs> so who? Uh, <laughs> so who? 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 Um, what was the catalyst for like the twenty year anniversary tour that you're about to? You're you're going on this year, right? That's coming up. Yeah. So it was another organic thing. It just happened to pop up. So we had uh, landed the Crucial Fest in Salt Lake City, mm. and that was like the initial date that we had, and then. 
uh, Salt Lake City is about a nine hour drive from here. So I'm like, well, let's, if we're going to go to Salt Lake City, let's try to book some other dates. So I ended up booking like Reno and Sa or Reno and then, um, like San Diego, stuff like that. So I made a little tour out of it. Um, and then my bass player, our bass player, Adrian, had mentioned, like, wait a minute, that's the same week as Burning Man. So he's, he's I, I, I go to, <laughs> I'm going to Burning Man. So I'm like, oh shit. So I'd already booked the tour. So I called uh, our original bass player, Mike, and I said, like, hey, Adrian's going to be gone. Um, can you fill in for him for these dates? Like, yeah, I'd love to do it. So uh, I was thinking, like, instead of Mike, because Mike hasn't been in the band since what, 2000, I can't remember, 11, mm -hmm. 10 or 11. So it's been a while since. And I was like, well, I don't want to learn all these songs. Like, because we have, we play so many songs. Like, well, how about we just do like a Carpe Diem reunion tour because we haven't, we did it in London and it was awesome. And people in America are like, why don't you do one here? Why don't you do one here? I'm like, well, here's the opportunity. Like, we'll get Mike back in the band who is our original bass player who played on Carpe Diem. So we have the original Carpe Diem lineup. Nice, nice, nice. It's kind of our, we haven't been able to celebrate that at all yet in America. So I was like, well, let's just make this Carpe Diem. And that way you don't only have, only have to learn that record. We're going <laughs> to play a lot of new, often new record too. But so it just kind of organically happened. Like, let's just do a Carpe Diem since Mike's in the band. So that's just how it. So that wasn't planned either. Just one of those things where it just made sense, you know, at the time. Is it still the? Uh, is that part of the plans for your Furnace Fest appearance too, to play Carpe Diem or more heavy Carpe Diem material on that show? On uh, which one? Sorry, Furnace Fest. Oh, Furnace Fest. I, you know, I don't know. Uh, well, Mike, Mike's only doing the West Coast stuff with us. H will be back uh, for Furnace Fest, so I don't know how long it's set. We have a Furnace Fest or anything, so it just kind of we'll play it by ear. But we just. Most of our set is kind of carbonium heavy anyway, so it's not. Yeah, you know, I always think we play these three or four songs off carbonium anyway. Interesting. Um, yeah. Well, uh, your last record before this year's uh, upcoming release was in 2018, so about five years ago. Uh, but you're releasing uh, in July. Well, it's it's either out or coming out this week or something like that. I'm not exactly sure when this podcast is airing, but as of recording this in June. Uh, in July, you'll have uh, album number seven, which is also titled Seven. So, mm -hmm. was that another organic thing? Like, what happens with, with like, do you guys plan? Uh, we don't plan anything. We already went over that. But, you know, how does new music and how do new albums and singles and EPs come about in the Woolhaven universe? Yeah, I mean, we started writing right in 2019, um, this record, and, uh, and then COVID hit. So, when COVID hit, we were just like, okay, well, now we got so much time to like work on this thing. So we just took those three years where as long as we were locked down, just writing the record, going in the studio, recording it, um, with no really time schedule at all. You know, we're like, well, whenever the world opens up, we'll maybe we'll have enough rec songs to put out a record. So, uh, so that it was also kind of organic. We didn't, we had initially wanted to put out like, a single or something in mm -hmm. 2020 because we were playing download that year so we thought maybe a single would cool would be cool to have something up when we go to download but then download got canceled mm -hmm. so then it canceled like two years in a row after that so yeah you played you know as, one, i believe right yeah yeah so but we were supposed to play in 20 and 21 they both got canceled so that whole time that was the only thing we had planned so uh so we didn't really have any schedule no plans nothing let's just keep writing and then you know i always have the mind of calling it seven um, but I started just because it's our seventh record, you mm -hmm. know, I just thought it was kind of cool or whatever. And naming the album titles becomes such a pain in the ass. So just keep it simple, <laughs> seven, you know. Um, but the crazy thing is that we finished the record and we started looking at when to put it out. And we're like, okay, well, 2023, um, I think will be the year we can finish everything and put it out. And which is crazy when I started like looking, I'm like, well, 2023 is equal seven, which is crazy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that yeah. that wasn't that wasn't planned. And then uh, when I was talking to our label, um, we were talking about doing singles and when we get when we should put the record out. And and then all of a sudden, I was talking to him on the phone. And all of a sudden, just it hit me. I'm like, wait a minute, let's let's put it out on seven and seven, July seventh. And and uh, they looked at it like, oh my shit, oh my god, that's a Friday. That's perfect. Yeah. <laughs> so it just Locked happened. Like everything. Yeah, everything just kind of fell into place. And then we were able to get our show in Sacramento that same day as a record release show that happened to be open, you know. So everything just kind of fell into place in just very weird way. And uh, so, yeah, it just, I mean, the record could have came out in 2019, you know, but COVID kind of fucked that up. So, 
here we, here we are, you know, finally, Plus, it finally has, getting it out. It has to go the organic Will Haven way, you know. It seems everything just seems to kind of just like line up for you guys, like you said. So don't don't I rush it, don't push it. Yeah, that's, I guess that's part of the universe, right? The more you force the universe, the more it pushes back. If you mm-hmm. just let it ride, then it's, shit will just happen, you know. Uh, Jeff, what do you do uh, outside of Will Haven when you have free time? Whether it's for your, oh. if you don't want to talk about your daily gig, your job, whatever you do for hobbies or whatever. But you know, what are your your jobs? Also interesting as well. Yeah, I I, well, I just work for a, a company and I just basically just do some office stuff for them, um, some online ordering and stuff like that. So it's a really chill job. I mean, sometimes I can work from home, whatever. Um, I mean, I worked at UPS for a long time, and then when uh, there was a tour coming up and I asked for to leave of absence, they said no, like, well, fuck it, I'm leaving. <laughs> so I ended up quitting, but I was there for like 10 years, whatever, uh, 11 years. But up until then, and, they were uh, cool with you kind of like moonlighting in the you know band world? Yeah, well, I was working part-time for a long time. I was working the, uh, the graveyard shift from like 4 to 9 in the morning. Uh, so not, um, so drive, not have, driving uh, the truck, really, just kind of like doing sorting or packaging stuff? So, yeah, I was doing sorting. I was unloading the, the trucks at first, and then I went to sorting. And then I, during Christmas, I'd help the driver deliver packages out, out there. And then, uh, yeah, then I, I was thinking about taking a, a bigger, fuller position. And then, but, you know, they had changed management. My manager was actually really cool at the time, and he was totally supportive of the band. And I got a new supervisory manager, and they weren't as cool. So I'm like, fuck it. You know, I'll, I'll find something else. So you got to find a, a, uh, a manager that's a fan of the band. That way, you know. Yeah, they, they weren't. It. They weren't. I asked my old supervisor to come to shows, and then <laughs> so he was he was really cool about it. But uh, yeah, so I quit that and then started working for this company. So I've been in this company for quite a while, and I don't know. I just got a shitload of hobbies, you know, like to me, life is all about having a shitload of hobbies. You know, yeah. I don't like being bored. So I mean, I raced motorcycles for ten years. Um, I race motocross. I I surf a lot now, which is like nice and easy on the body than riding motocross. Did uh, you not surf prior? Yeah, I've surfed my whole life, but um, I've my girlfriend and I have have a house that or we don't own it, but we have a place we can go to that's right on the ocean, and we've been going there a lot. And so, and it's right on near the beach. So I've been going down there all the time and just surfing my yeah. ass off. And so that's kind of my my main passion is that. Um, I play I play a lot of golf with some friends of mine, uh, which is awesome. Uh, kills the time, and <laughs> uh, so yeah, I, I try to keep busy. You know, yeah. I, I don't watch I don't watch much TV at all. If I don't watch TV, I'm like writing music or, you know, just doing shit. Of course, I got dogs. I got to walk all the time. It's always a uh, time consuming, but um, yeah, I just try to keep busy and try to have fun. And you know, hobbies are a big part of my life. Yeah, so I, I just probably want. It's, Wind down a little bit. I was going crazy for a while with everything, but it's winding down, and I'm getting older. Um, yeah, I was going to ask if you had kids or anything like that, but that's probably inappropriate because obviously, if you don't or do, but it sounds like you had a lot of free time for activities, so that's why I was asking. But yeah, uh, no, no, no kid, no yeah. kid, two dogs. That's all I got. It's kind of the same thing, almost. You know, I have a dog, so I understand. Uh, yeah, getting up there, she's twelve. This she turned twelve this year, so. You know, she's yeah, like, mine's thirteen and thirteen to sixteen. They're getting up there as oh, well. Wow, yeah. Well, hey, if I can yeah. get, if, if she can get to sixteen, I'll be happy as hell. That, um, that's exactly what I said about mine. Like, <laughs> yeah, if they make me sixteen, I'll be cool. Yeah. Um, well, yeah. Keep going on that. Yeah. No, it's all. It, it's always interesting to find out like what you know people's interests are and stuff like that. Like you know you you're from California. Are, are you from California? Are you from the Sacramento area? Born and raised. Yeah. Yeah. Born and raised. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I would assume that if you hadn't said surfing at some point. You know, as a hobby, <laughs> you wouldn't you wouldn't be considered a Californian. But you know, I grew up. I'm on the other coast. I'm on the East Coast, uh, so I grew up next to the Atlantic Ocean. But uh, like, I don't surf. Like, I don't know how to surf. But my um, excuse was, you know, we have like ankle to shin high waves out here on the East Coast from Florida. You know, at least you guys have like you know stuff that you guys can get pitted in, and you know, you know, <laughs> do all sorts of cool stuff. We we don't have that here, unless like a hurricane comes. So I never really got like drawn into it. But it's it which looks is funny because cool. Ke- Kelly Slater's from Florida. Yeah, well, you know, <laughs> he like, also surfs all that? over. He surfs all over. You know, he practices elsewhere. Yeah, it's true. He, he travels the world now. Yeah, I always thought that when I was like 
when I found out he was from Cocoa Beach, I'm like, how the hell did Kelly Slater become number one in the world? He's from Cocoa Beach. Yeah, right. And so I've been there, and I haven't seen. I haven't seen anyways. No, yeah, yeah. We have a big, <laughs> a real long shelf here. And again, like you know, he may have, uh, he may have gotten a lot of practice in when like these, these uh, hurricanes just kind of like whiff right by Florida because where where he would be from and where I'm from, it's in that little pocket where we kind of get missed a lot of the times and just get like the storm surge or the wind and stuff like that from it. But every now and then we'll get yeah. a little, a little, that's what he said. Every once in a while, they would get a decent, uh, surge in there that he could, that they could serve. Interesting. Wasn't much of much, but he, it was once, once in a while. How'd you get into motocross? Is that like a California thing as well? Just like all the boys ripping it up on the hills and you're just like, yeah, I want to do that. Well, my mom had bought me a 50 CC Suzuki when I was probably eight. And oh, okay. wow. I would just, and my <laughs> uncle had a house that had just tons of property. So I'd ride that thing all over and crash it and jump it. And, the eighties, um, am I right? <laughs> yeah. I would have, well, no, this would have been like, yeah, or late seventies probably. Um, and then I, I kind of got out of it for a little bit and then, uh, I was raced and then I don't know if anybody heard, but there's a thing called speedway racing where it's like, it's uh, flat tracks, kind of with no brakes, mm. um, run on methanol. They're gnarly as hell. And I, I was going to those when I was a kid, watching those races. And I always like told myself, I want to race those one day. So, at 30 years old, I think I finally bought my speedway bike and started racing speedway every Friday night for 10 years, um, nice. which is the stupidest, stupidest thing to do for a musician because like <laughs> get hurt. that's one of the most dangerous sports you could ever do. That's it's worse than motocross. Um, and then while I was racing speedway, a lot of my friends were in motocross too. So I ended up getting into that. And so I was riding a couple of motocross, a lot of motocross races and stuff. So it's always been in my blood. You know, I was uh-huh. born in the dirt and uh, I just, I love it. And I miss it. I don't do it now. I, I sold my bikes. I retired from speedway and I, <laughs> Sold my motocross bike to my buddy. What's the difference like, between speedway? What 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 exactly is speedway? So speedway is on a small oval track, uh-huh. and uh, it's really hard. To, I mean, you, you just have to look it up, but it's it's basically they're they're only modif- the bikes are modified for only that sport. Um, you can't, they're not for jumping. They're just straight for flat track. Mm-hmm. Um, they they run off methanol. They go to zero to sixty in three seconds. They're way about a. 180 pounds um there's no brakes on them uh okay, okay, okay. just just a, just a clutch and gas and, and you go um it's it's a gnarly sport it's only it's very small like it's it's popular in where i'm living and there's a town called auburn california which is like kind of our northern california like speedway track uh-huh. uh it's, it's pretty well known but i get to get about four thousand five thousand people every friday night out there did you guys and like grow- it's did you guys grow up with like lead in your water? Because it sounds like a bunch of just like psychos would. You know, oh yeah, no, yeah, the guys <laughs> psychos that are... just want to be like death-defying, do that stuff. It's, with no it's breaks. Just straight, ad- straight adrenaline junkies, <laughs> dude. Like, yeah, they're not. Gnar- these guys are gnarly. Like, they are. They definitely have screwed looses, you know. Um, but it's it's pop. It's really popular in Europe and England. That's where okay. Speedway's like its home base is over there, and then. We do have a few tracks down south too. We would race the circuit stuff, so it's kind of underground though, which is fitting because that's kind of my whole thing. Is like everything I do is kind of like underground. Yeah, <laughs> it's never, yeah, a little niche. never mainstream shit, you know. But uh, but uh, yeah, I, I had a blast doing it. Did like, you ever? Get, I only got. Did you ever get messed up? Did you ever get like you know a, a really good crash in there, or did you just like really dodge it for a decade? Um, I took a good few good tumbles. The last crash I did is one I retired on. I. Flipped. I hit somebody and I flipped about three times. Went into the fence and I got up and I was like, had a big hematoma on my side and I couldn't walk for like three weeks. But um, that was the worst thing I ever had. It was my last one. After that, my bike was so fucked up. I was like, oh, I can't. I'm not gonna fix it. I'm just gonna. <laughs> I'm just gonna just quit. I'm gonna retire. So, um, but luckily, yeah, nothing. No broken arms. Like no, nothing fucked up. I was a good racer though. Like I was. I wasn't out there like twisting the throttle. I was very calculated, <laughs> very smart. I knew I was in a band and I had shows coming up. I didn't want to fucking wad myself up. So I was very strategic. But What's the average but, uh, age of the drivers out there? Because obviously you say that 30 you, you joined. And so I would assume when you took your big tumble, you were closer to 40 or, or around that age. But like how old are like the drivers? And like do they just 
you said you showed up on a Friday night and they just they let like they just let anybody and everybody just race run amok on these things. So it's just like savage yeah. people just running around. Oh yeah, it, it's a fucking circus. Oh, but wow. yeah, when I when I started, there was no place to practice, so you would just show up the race and race. <laughs> <laughs> um, but they have they they have the vision, so they have like the juniors, which is like kids from like nine to like thirteen, and then they have then they have a then they have classes. So they have a third division class, which is the newbie newbie guys that are out there, and those guys just that they wad themselves up every week. And then you got division two, where it's like the intermediate class, and division one are like the guys that are really good that actually make money at it. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, I got up to. I was almost division one. I quit right before I got into the the first division, um, so I went through all the stages of it. But uh, yeah, it's it's. But it was cool because it's it was a very small community, and yeah. I met so many rat. I mean, some of my best friends in the world are people that I met through that sport, and I'm still very close to them to this day. And we all looked out for each other. We all traveled together. It was like kind of being in a band, but in a motorcycle, right? You know, racing system. So, um, but yeah, it's I I I. This is one of my favorite things I did in my life, and I'm just so glad I did it. Because I was for a long time, I was scared to do it. But it's <laughs> gnarly as fuck, and yeah. I was like, you know what? Just do it. If you don't do it, you're gonna regret it. And so I ended up doing it, and I had the best time of my life. So obviously, you're like shitting bricks, nervous for your first race, and like obviously, you know, like you said, you were scared to do it, and you eventually bit the bullet. So like, you're running through that first, you, you know, you're hitting that th- throttle for the first time in a race, like. Are you shitting yourself? Or are you just like so oh, yeah. psyched? Uh, or are you nervous? Uh, or are you scared? Luckily, what was crazy thing is like normally they have they go by yardages. So the new guys really start on the zero yard line, and, and as you get better, you start go further back. So the the scary thing is when you're in the front, and you have the really guys, good guys behind you, and they pass you or knock you over. That's the scary part. But luckily, my first race, they moved me to the back, so I was in the very back of the whole the yardage. They that was the first year they did it because they didn't want the older the newer guys in front. So and there was so many. I had like ten guys in my race at that race, maybe more than that. So I was dead last, and I was just putting around. I was just, like, getting the feel of it, you know, and <laughs> just like, oh, God, I'm actually doing it, you know? And so – but did they have to wait? Did they have to wait a little longer to let you just finish? Did they, you know, have yeah, right? an extra yeah. couple of minutes? Yeah, I wasn't that bad, but I wasn't trying to challenge anybody. <laughs> but, uh, but, yeah, I made it out alive. I'm like, cool. And then after that, you know, you start getting confidence, and you start, like, learning how to, like, race. And yeah. so by the time – I mean, I, I wanted to – quite a few like made events which was awesome i worked my way up to it but how, long, it, how long does it take to get used to it i mean because the curiosity is because you don't have anywhere to practice you know there's no track where you can like fucking practice or race other people in this particular weird sport uh but like so how often i mean obviously you're you're there every week or you're trying to get there every week but how often or how long until you are like competing to like get mid mid of the pack which not which isn't mm. winning you know which isn't winning but you know, you're messing around. You're getting in. You're getting your bearings. How long until you're you know you're into it? I can't remember when I won my. Well, yeah, that's a good question. I don't know. I think it took me about a year to finally like get comfortable with it, or, or at least one season, which is like six, maybe fourteen races, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's one of those things like that. I mean, motocross is different because motocross is is a bit of a skill. You know, it's more of like you got to navigate jumps and ruts and turns and speedways. It's one of those things where it's like you just realize like you just got to fucking man up and just hit the gas, you know, and just go. And you just got to ride the bike as hard as you can, you know. And then once you get that, once you're over that fear of like just letting it go, because those bikes are fast, you know. Yeah. And once you get comfortable with the speed of it and just letting go and just getting aggressive, then things start, you know, coming a little easier for you it's just getting over that hump of like oh shit i don't want to go that fast. i mean that's like a, <laughs> that, that's a whole adage for life right there jeff you know what i mean you let go and things start coming for you know what i mean it gets easier things yeah start it's coming like, to you you just gotta grab the throttle man and go yeah whiskey throttle the shit out of that thing man <laughs> totally yeah uh, totally so you you know you move on from that you you tumble you have a good tumble get some road road rash obviously uh or no not road rash because you're on dirt right you're on dirt on these things yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. You get some gravel. But it feels like road rash. Some so. dirt burn or whatever you want to call it. <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> uh, so what what takes the place of this wild adrenaline-inducing uh, sport? So, like, because obviously, you know, you have to have it. You can't, you know, you, have, you can't smoke crack for 10 years and then just cut it off. You have to, like, replace <laughs> it with Coke or, Coke, you know, like or Coca-Cola or coffee or, some, or smoking cigarettes, you know. So what replaced the... Uh, 
the dopamine that you were getting from all that? The music, man. Like, oh, okay. I, because music, I mean, right when I was racing, that's when kind of Willowhaven had kind of done its first little breakup. Um, so I was still playing with some other bands and stuff, but it wasn't Willowhaven. So my, my whole world wasn't music. It was just kind of a side thing. And then when I started racing, that's when Willowhaven kind of was became more serious. And even though we were kind of in and out, um, it was more of a constant thing. And so music to me is like just as much of a adrenaline rush as oh, racing yeah. mm-hmm. mo- dirt bikes. You know, like writing a new song or playing live, like that equals that same adrenaline. I mean, that's probably why I rode dirt bikes. Is like I needed that same feeling that I could get with music. So that music just moves me, man. And like it just fires me up and I love playing and um, I love playing live and I love writing new songs. And so, you know, I've become way more mellow and I can play a lot of golf now, which is like easy <laughs> on the bones. But, but I, I feel that, that rage, that fuel that I need to get out. It's, yeah, I guess you through music and luckily Will Haven's like, we're firing all cylinders now. And those guys are just with me, you know, on everything. So it feels good to like be in a band and be able to get that out. And when we were practicing, we're actually like, you know, three times a week now and it just feels good, you know? Mm-hmm. And I always thank those guys. Like, thank you for like, let rocking out like you know thanks for coming to practice thanks for letting us like get together and, and create music and and just get this out you know because i need it you know yeah well um anything else on the uh anything else that they can look forward to obviously you got the got the carpe diem uh mini tour you have seven coming out in july um you've had a couple singles i think you've had three up until today or around you know around three released uh yeah up to today uh what else is up in the pipeline in the next couple you know weeks months years for Wilhaven? Uh, you know i like it's one of those things where i get, we don't have shit planned it's like <laughs> it's, everything just kind of happens so you know like as much as we would love this band to like get bigger or you know get a bigger audience which is like it's not so much about the money or fame it's like i just want our music to get out to people i want to hear people that hear our music you know Mm -hmm. and that's what's most important to me so whatever that is whatever maybe something goes viral i don't know what the fuck happens but we just kind of take it day by day and we do you know we have that we have a couple of tours coming up that cover dm thing furnace fest we are working to try to get over to europe in october right now um but other than that we're just kind of just letting things unfold as it is you know if we it's one of those things is like we all know being in the business for so long you're like if something pops off then things start coming yeah. in you know like if the record does well and promoters want to book us at their venue or whatever they'll reach out or you know people do interviews I, it just we just kind of like let it come you know we yeah. don't try to force anything because the more you force like the more it, you just get disappointed you know so for us just we just want to have fun and create music and, and play live shows and hopefully gain some new fans and you know, keep the band going, you know, because the band's really important to us and we love it and we would love to see it grow and, and kind of take its own identity. It's like, I'm in Willhaven, but I don't, I consider Willhaven its own thing. You mm-hmm. know, it's not, it's it's a part of me, but it's not mine. You know, it's Willhaven's its own monster. I just, I just help feed it, you know? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, just kind of let, just keep going. And we actually are writing new stuff already and some of the new, new stuff is fucking killer. So I'm excited awesome. about that. Yeah. So, we're just chugging along, man. Like we've been doing this for fucking thirty years, you know. It's like we just we just kind of just <laughs> keep rowing that boat down the fucking stream and just see what happens. Really. Yeah, I mean, there's how long do you think you'll end up doing it? Like, do you do you think of yourself as like a seven year old man still doing this? <laughs> it's funny because like when you're in your twenties, your thirties, you fuck, I'm not gonna die. Yeah, I'm gonna be out of here by forty, you know, but. It's wild though. That, 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 that's, I don't mean to interrupt you, but like it's wild because like I remember my dad telling me when I was a younger kid, and it just so happens to be the band that he was talking about is Limp Biscuit. But he was like, mm-hmm. "They're going to be nobody in like five years." You know what I mean? And I'm like, "Okay." And I mean, like that's what I thought. <laughs> you know, and you think that because the band is so new at that time, like you're only yeah. you know the bands you were used to hearing on the radio have been around at that particular point for thirty fucking years. So there's already legacy bands that are on the radio, but you know, it's wild that even bands much, much smaller than Limp Biscuit stayed around for a much longer periods of time. And now here we are. Like, that's why I was asking, like, at when you were younger, you didn't think like, oh yeah, I'm still going to be listening to dead, you know, dead guy at 70. But 
I'm willing to bet nine 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 out of ten times you we let this life play out, you're probably listening to Dead Guy at seventy. I think you know or it's, 10 out it's of 10. funny. I think what it is is that I think people just love like people that play organically or play their instruments. Like, I mean, Lembisky gets a lot of shit, but they write good songs, you know, and they play when they play live, they don't play to a, a backing track. They don't play to a click track. They just go out there and rock it, you know, and people like that energy. They like that, like that. There's an energy to it that you can't get with the band that plays to a backing track or, yeah. you know, whatever it's like, or uh, it's, it's, it's a different world, man. Like I've, I've seen all kinds of bands like being around in the, in the scene and the bands that always last are the bands that actually play, as a band, you know, like, I mean, it's just nothing better than that, you know? And I just, I just think those bands will be that bands that play drums, guitar, bass, and sing will always be around and they can always play, you know, there'll always be a, a market for them, you know? And if you write a good song, it's going to last forever, you know? And I don't know. I, I do think that we, I mean, William's in a different position is because like, Grady and Mitch and Adrian and Sean, who plays in Will Haven now, like those are my best friends. Like those are my guys I hang out with outside of Will Haven. You know, th that's my family. You know, if I have anything in, wrong in my life or something had happens, I call one of those guys. I don't call some other friend. Like those are the guys that I call for advice, for, for anything. You know, those are my boys. So as long as we're still a family, like, and music is our love. And I think we'll do well even as until we get totally tired of it, you know, or you know something else. But so if William's in a different position because we're not a band made up of people that we met online or right. through a magazine or whatever. It's it's different. We're a family, so I can see we'll even going as long as we. Well, we'll I mean, we'll just play music just for the hell of it. We don't need to play live shows. We'll just go in the practice room and just jam together. You yeah. know, it's like yeah. that's just how William is. But you know, for bands like I mean, Deftones are in the same boat too because the core of that band they've been friends since they were you know 14 years old so it's it's they're in the same camp as Willhaven, so they could go on forever as well as long as they keep everything else intact but um but yeah i think there's i i hope to go as long as i can i was funny because like there was an interview me and grady did an interview uh, last week and he's always been it's kind of been in and out of the band mm -hmm. you know he's he quit and he came back and i always kind of wonder where his head is at and they asked the same question. They're like, you know, how long do you think well, they can be around or do you guys want to do the record? Grady's all, I think this band, this band can go on forever. And I was like, whoa, okay, that's cool. He's never <laughs> said that before, you know? So I'm like, oh, okay, that, that made me feel better. Like, he's into it. And he, I think, it's funny as you get older, I think Deftones is going through the same thing as like, especially after COVID, as you get older, you appreciate being in a band and being able to do this yeah. and playing music with your friends because when you're 20 you don't think about that shit you know you're just like i'm here playing music and, 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 and but as you get older you're like oh shit like we did we've done a lot and this band is like will haven has taken me around the world yeah. you know and yeah. places i thought i would never ever go to in my life you know and meet people that i never thought i'd meet in my life and, and you can't like, even play guitar really you know what i'm saying yeah Jeez. totally it's like, I, I, just, I was like i did the, the biggest joke in the world is i got to tour the world and i don't even know how to fucking play a good note you know it's like it's always been my, my my saying but i think yeah it's like as you get older you just appreciate it you know like even bands like rolling stones like they still go because they just like damn we're, we can still play shows let's do it i mean you, you know? can like, right yeah it's like if you can do it do it fuck it like and they're set they're setting such a high bar for that kind of stuff too man they're setting bars that oh, like, yeah, yeah. no one's really going to be able to touch. I mean, you can't... I don't even think a band is on trajectory to be able to touch 60 years live, you know, playing 60 years live. That's hard. I man. don't know, man. The way people are, like, keeping in shape and staying healthy. Yeah, and... but you have to stay in the same band. You know what I mean? You get, that's what I'm saying. Well, you got to stay in the same that's, band and, and do the whole true. thing. It's, <laughs> oh, that 60 is a years, problem. Like, 60 years at, at one go is so hard. Yeah, being 50, a band with, with tough too, man. Tough. people is yeah, being a band with people is, is gnarly. You know, luckily Will Haven, like I said, we're all family, but man, like there are some personalities that just <laughs> clash and just don't work. You know, no matter how hard they try, it just doesn't work. You know, I feel you. Like we that. see Rage get Rage against Machine, like one of the biggest bands in the world. They just cannot keep it together. I'm like, come on, man. Oh yeah, and just the world, keep it together, the world, man. The world kind of needs you to keep it together. You know what I mean? Oh yeah, <laughs> it's like you do. You need it. Forget you guys. It's about us. Yeah. You know, fuck that. Um, last but. question. Last question, and then we'll wrap this up, and I'll send you on your way this Monday evening. Sure. Uh, 
Will Haven and Carpe Diem vinyl. Is that on the? Uh, oh. Is that on the plans? That's so funny. I've getting so many questions about that. <laughs> um, <laughs> of course. Yeah, I mean, I've got that about El Diablo, Carpe Diem. Um, I would, I would love to. Uh, you know, it's something I just got to talk to Jordan from Revelation about. I, I don't, I don't know what our where we stand with those guys as far as that, but um, I would love to. I mean, I think we have the means to do it now with Minus Head, you know. Um, and I mean, I just got to put the wheels in motion. I don't think it'd be a, an issue. Uh, I think it was probably a good idea. Now we're doing this anniversary tour to do it for yeah, sure. Right. But, um, but yeah, I'd love to press those old vinyls for sure. Because I think we only did well. Well, we did a couple like colored vinyls that were just like I think we only pressed like two hundred at the or five hundred maybe it was. So um, it'd be cool to do something like that, you know, even if it's just like a limited run of stuff, yeah. you know, which would be kind of a cool collector's item for somebody. But um, yeah, I'd love to. I mean, I get asked all the time, so I just I just get <laughs> up my ass and and just go down the right path and make it happen. Hey, well, I can't make a California do do anything, you know, nor can anyone for the most part. Everyone's so laid back over there. We get a little, <laughs> we're, we're a little laid back over here, but you guys got more weed for a longer period of time. You know, you guys have been smoking weed for longer, longer. Uh, so you're true. way more laid back. But uh, Jeff, I had a great time chatting with you today. Uh, we appreciate it. And, you know, best of luck with Seven and everything coming up with Willhaven, man. Um, and mm-hmm. keep in touch. I'll see you uh, we'll see you at Furnace Fest. We'll be there. So, um, oh, you're coming out? Awesome. Yeah, we'll yeah awesome. Yeah, definitely. Come hang out. Uh, come hang out for the day. We, yeah. uh, we won't, we're not going to know anybody there, so <laughs> more more friends the better. <laughs> uh, yeah, okay. Um, we will definitely see. I'm going to try. I'm trying to get uh, William to come with us. William is the person or... He was the he was the man behind the Dead Guy documentary. He's kind of a oh really oh awesome. He works with us That's a little right. bit. We're working on a couple different projects right now. He works with Liam. We kind of like partnered with him on some video oh, okay. stuff. So we got we'll a lot tell of, him. It. Go ahead. Yeah, I'll tell him. Yeah, I was gonna just, yeah tell him. I, I love that documentary. It's awesome. I mean, Dead Guy's one of my favorite bands, and I, I actually got to talk to Tim a little bit recently, and and I expressed my love for him and how much <laughs> that band means to me, and and how ahead of the time they are. So oh, yeah, for sure. That uh that documentary I mean I'm, I'm almost done with it I think I have still a couple minutes left but I, I love the way it was it was done and you get to see those guys personalities and because I mean that was one band that didn't get no. a lot of like press and stuff like that they were really kind of just like their own thing you know it's and wild. so to like it's find out how, how big they are or it's wild how big that sound is and like how big like a lot of the early metalcore sound is and how oh, influential dude, it is I mean, like those bands, like them and Bloodlet and like Earth Crisis, like. I mean, you guys are in that. That's what I'm and, saying earlier. Like, you guys are in that ballpark. You know what I mean? Like. We are. We are, but like we were kind of like the second generation of that. It was like those bands were there before us, you know. So we have to give. I have yeah, to you give guys were early nineties. You guys were what? You're, we're talking like a year or two. Yeah. A year or two difference. Looking but, back, it's not that big of a. You know what I mean? Looking back. It, it, it's not, but I, I mean, I wouldn't lie to say those, those bands inspired the shit out of me, you well, know, early on. You're being, and you're so, being very, to this uh, day, you're being very day, humble. Like I, you're being very humble. Yeah. And I, to this day, like, I've, I've even talked to Bloodlet guys. I'm like, dude, you guys are a huge influence on me. Like, that, that 90s metal core stuff, like, is some of the best stuff I, to this day, you know, like, their riffs, their, just everything was just like a huge influence on me. So, but I was stoked. I'm going back to the guy. I was stoked they got a documentary because those yeah. guys deserve some, some attention for sure. Those guys were the pioneers of that 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 sound for yeah. sure. Well, I'll definitely go ahead and relay that to William. But yeah, we got some more awesome. stuff coming Thanks. out. Uh, the pair of us. We like I said, he's kind of like uh, our executive of video around here at Lamb Goat. So we we got some more awesome. kind of like documentary uh, documentaries and more like you know educational styled content pieces coming out that are focus mainly on like um you know old school information informative like hardcore metalcore lineage i love it man that's that stuff needs to be yeah documented because like that was that was a huge scene and that that definitely well, I, think we're com- I think we're coming around on like the sick you know the secular thing that's like the cycle like now enough, enough time has passed that we can be like oh look at this tour from 20 years ago look at the names on this tour and then yeah. now they're like the five biggest bands of all time, you know, for our yeah, yeah. Or and then, but it's like it's like the new metal thing. I mean, that's definitely made a huge comeback, oh, you yeah. know. And there's no reason why that the '90s metal, you know, hardcore scene couldn't people couldn't wake up to that too. Because I mean, there's some amazing bands that came from that time that people have no idea they existed, you know. Yeah. So, 
like if people got to hear dead guy they're like holy shit this destroys everything out right now like this yeah. is crazy you know yeah. i mean i see dead guys actually doing a tour in europe coming up um that Tim had posted i'm like that's so fucking rad he, they've never been to europe yeah and i'm like that's so rad they're finally getting like some recognition and like some some flowers that they deserve you know and i, I actually told tim I was like, you guys need an opener <laughs> but uh <laughs> no yeah, no thanks like, <laughs> yeah right but I, I just i love like that those bands are getting some recognition because like yeah. they didn't they didn't they didn't get it where they they deserve it for sure yeah and we're gonna do everything we can to kind of continue that going forward whether it's a new band or those old bands you know kind of yeah. link the two together with the youth and the elders of the uh of the scene so that's what we're, we're yeah i mean do. there's it's a market for it i mean like i grill a business is still touring of course they're, they're all they're, a, they're, a they're, lot of bands are still out there just still yeah, turning the wheels still, man yeah, it's awesome. I love seeing it, man. And they they still got a crowd. And I mean, they got young. Yeah, it's not just a bunch of fifty year olds. They no, got no, no, yeah. you know younger younger kids in there too, which is rad. Yeah, I mean, I, I I when I see a lot of like, I've seen a lot of bands recently that are you know older uh, legacy style bands, whether they're in the hardcore scene, metal scene, or even like the certain new metal bands. Um, and I'm just like floored sometimes, and I'm like, how how does this kid know? You know what I mean? How does this kid know about this? I'm, yeah, that's word of I'm mouth, always, man. I'm always curious. Word of mouth. That. Yeah, I mean those documentaries help too. You know, some kids gonna stumble upon a do- the dead guy thing. And go, oh, this is fucking rad. Like, yeah, hopefully. It's funny. It's funny because I was I was at I went and saw Deftones uh, when they when they did that Gajura tour recently, and I remember I was in the crowd and I'm looking around going, holy shit, there are so many young kids here. Kids, like yeah. I was floored, and but a lot of goth chicks like. It looked like 1997 all over again. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was like, "What the fuck?" No, is it didn't. On? There was that, that. There weren't that many girls back then in the, in the scene back then. Uh, Jeff. You know that. There are way more girls now. Yeah, just, maybe. I'm here but, for it. I mean, I'm here was, for it. I'm just a little jealous yeah, that it wasn't like that but, back in the day. Yeah, yeah. But I was tripping. Like how many like goth girls there were, and like young kids. I'm like this is crazy. Like this band is like we're 50s, and these kids are like. There's tons of kids at the show, and that was yeah. really cool to see. I was stoked on that that like they they're able to like find get a new generation of fans. So, it's yeah, wild. I mean, there's 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 kids out there that love that stuff. They just got to be, you know, just kind of shown because yeah. they don't. There's so much crap out there now with TikTok and YouTube and all this stuff. The kids got to like sift through. So yeah. they just got to be pointed in the right direction. Really, it's it's wild because uh, I'll turn forty this year. So um, it's it's really been a mind fuck for me to see all this like in the last couple of years has come back around and then for it to be like, like I said earlier, like, you know, I kind of, when my dad said that, you know, that music won't ever last, I kind of assumed that it wouldn't last, right? Like it was a fat and like, and then new metal kind of yeah. faded away really shortly after that, you know, cause it got made fun of and it wasn't as cool cause the industry kind of like, you know, everyone in the, everyone in the industry wanted to get a piece of like rap rock and it got kind of like bastardized or whatever. And, you know, for the worst, but, it's really weird to be on this back end now at 40 seeing like hardcore metal still you know still doing its things it's still churning but then you have all this nostalgic stuff for the last 20 years coming back whether that be like you know will haven albums or other albums or other bands reuniting or you know new metal coming back because it's finally cool to like new metal again and it's just wild to be on the back end of that as a you know as a man instead of a child you know it's like looking at it going like it's crazy that it it's survived. Crazy. It survived, right? Like, you know, our little scene survived the infancy of it, you know, in the early 80s, 90s. Only well, reason it survives is it's good music. You know, there's, yeah. you can't deny it. Like, I mean, those bands put out some fucking... I mean, I still rock those records all the time. Oh, yeah, it's sure. still better than half the shit out right now, you know? <laughs> and it's like, the music just stands the test of time. Like, de- nobody still sounds like Dead Guy. But de- I mean, Dead Guy's been broken up for how long? And, like, there's not one band that still has the fucking angst and the craziness and the riffs that Dead Guy had, yeah. you know, there's no band like it. There's still to this day, no one's copied him. You know, there's no band like Coalesce. There's no band like Converge. Yeah. There's still no. There's no band like Earth Crisis. Even Snapcase is on there. I mean, like, it's just a different time, and it's crazy that you don't think more bands would copy them that no one has. Like, it just maybe I don't know, but yeah, it's it's cool to see. But what's cool is also these bands that they're coming back out. I mean they're putting out good music yeah you know like so all these bands that we love they're still putting out good shit you know like dead guy writing another record right now it'd probably be fucking phenomenal you know <laughs> i've heard some i've heard some i've heard blood like working on some stuff and it was so dead guy's bad. working on I'm some like, stuff 
Yeah, and I was like, come on, man, like, get this out, you know? I was like, it's still, it's so awesome. Want to hear yeah. some new music, so. I'm with you, though, man. I'm, I'm ride or die. Like, <laughs> I'm, I'm much love for that scene and those guys. Like, yeah, I'm all for it. Well, that's cool, man. And again, man, I appreciate your time. Uh, so I'll, I'll cut you off. We got a little long-winded there. But again, it's what happens when you bring up, you know, that's all good. side tangents and things. Yeah, yeah, it's all, just, it's all good content. Podcast, podcast is all conversation, <laughs> it's man. It's all good. No, it, yeah. Well, again, all right, man, brother. I appreciate it, though. I no appreciate problem. it a lot. All the great success. Uh, like I said, we'll see you at Furnace Fest in September. Yes. All the success with Seven in, on the 7 7 on the 23rd of, or not 23rd, on the 2023, um, you know, July 7th. Oh, yeah. The album will be out. Yeah. So pick it up, stream it, buy some merch. And like I said, we'll see you at uh, Furnace, big dog. I'll, I'll come find you. Thanks, right. brother. Take it easy, Jeff. All right. Take care.